Hello, and you are listening to Bill Murphy's Red Zone Podcast. I interview leaders who inspire me in the areas of exponential technologies, business innovation, entrepreneurship, thought leadership, enterprise IT security, neuroscience, philosophy, personal development, and more. Welcome to the show. Hello, everybody. This is Bill Murphy, your host of the Red Zone podcast. Welcome back. If you are not new to the show, and if you are new to the show, you're in for a treat today. I was literally thrilled to have Stephen Kotler come on the show. Stephen's work has impacted me very deeply for the past six years, and I have devoured all of his material. Stephen is a New York Times bestselling author, an award-winning journalist, and a co-founder director of research for the Flow Genome Project. He's one of the world's leading experts on ultimate human performance. His latest work, Bold, was called A Visionary Roadmap for Change by President Bill Clinton and spent many weeks atop both the New York Times and Wall Street Journal bestseller lists. His previous book, Rise of Superman, was one of the most talked about books in 2013 and the first book in history to land on national bestseller lists in the sports, science, and business categories simultaneously. In it, Stephen decodes the science of flow, an optimal state of consciousness where we feel at our best and perform at our best. Just as Rise explores the upper limits of individual possibility. His book, Abundance, explores the upper limits of societal possibility, breaking down four emerging forces that give humanity the potential to significantly raise global standards of living over the next 20 to 30 years. Abundance spent 10 weeks atop the New York Times bestseller list and appeared on four prestigious best book of the year lists. His writings have been translated into over 40 languages and appeared in over 80 publications, including the New York Times, Atlantic Monthly, Forbes, Wired, and Time. Alongside his wife, author Joy Nicholson, Stephen is the co-founder of Rancho de Chihuahua, a dog sanctuary in the mountains of northern New Mexico. What you're going to get from my discussion with Stephen is, is being a fly on the wall of a conversation with one of the top leaders and exploring the frontiers of human potential. I don't believe that you can talk about exponential technologies, leadership, enterprise IT security, or any of the topics we discussed in this program without discussing human potential. While listening, you will learn about science, neurobiology, ways you can increase flow in your life, leadership in times of exponential change, reducing signal to noise in your brain, reducing the impact of your inner critic, how to develop lateral thinking, and how to pay attention. By reading Stephen's books and engaging with the body of research around his books, I have greatly expanded my own capacity and capabilities as an individual, a father, a businessman, and a leader. Make sure to check out the resources on the show notes page to his programs at the Flow Genome Project, which I am currently taking and the books I've mentioned above. On the show notes page at redzonetech.net forward slash podcast, I will put all of this, including also how to connect with him on Twitter, of which he's very active on. I would encourage you to also to subscribe to my weekly exponential business IT newsletter, which you can access directly on the phone app for this podcast by pressing the show logo, and you'll see a link at the top on how to subscribe. Some of the curated content that my team and I put together each week cover, for example, this week we covered exponential medicine leaders. We covered topics on the microbiome revolution and the future of food, breakthroughs in digital manufacturing, robotics and AI, also a DNA hard drives to solve some of the looming data storage crises we have. Uh, the making of a corporate athlete, which we sourced from Harvard Business Review, and the wise CIO ditch digger, how to win non-physical battles. That's directly right in the enterprise IT security space. And then finally, Frontiers of Human Performance with Dr. Andrew Walsh, Director 
of high performance at Red Bull Stratos. I heard him speak recently and his video is public. So, okay, I think that covers everything. And as always, I appreciate you for listening. Now let's get into my fun and engaging interview with Stephen Kotler. I want to welcome you to the show today. Thanks for having me. So you've had this incredible string of success with these, with your books, with Abundance and and Rise of uh, Superman and, and with Bold, and now you have a, a new book coming out. And uh, why don't you just give me an idea about the context around the book and sort of how this, I guess it's not a trilogy, it's a four, four books in a row. Is there a word for that? It's worse than that because a lot of this starts, I mean, it literally like my investigation into kind of like questions around ultimate human performance and, you know, how much can we level up our game? Those kinds of questions, they go back all the way to like my first novel. They're there for <laughs> sure. My investigation of flow is my second book, my first nonfiction book. I do more flow in my third book, which is really a look at empathy and the relationship between humans and animals. And then, like, then I show abundance and rise of, you know, bold in Tomorrowland and, and stealing fire now. It's unfortunately, like, I've got one note. <laughs> I just hit it from a lot of different angles. Yeah, no, it's it's uh, definitely a theme and, and a major theme that's been super interesting to me. And, you know, one story that I, I want you to tell the audience, because unless it is a story that was very profound for me, it was the rafting that the individual, I forget his name, but he went down the Stakines River or some, it's, it's the river in Canada. Doug and Ammons. Doug, Doug Ammons, yes. You've got to tell that story because what I want to do is understand, obviously that's a, a guy athletically, you know, very gifted on the edge, but I'd love to kind of, you tell a story and then we could talk about how, you know, average human beings could start to, to tap into these potentialities. Well, Doug is, you know, Outside Magazine, which say what you want about it, it's certainly a Bible of adventure sports. And they made a list of kind of, I think it was the 100, I might have the number wrong, it's been a little while since I've looked at the data, top adventurers of the 20th century. And Doug Ammons is like number five or number eight, and nobody knows his name, because he's a kayaker. And he has, he's also a philosopher and a psychologist, and he runs two different psychological journals and he's an expert martial artist, and the list goes, he's a total polymath, he's an amazing human being, and a musician, it just, I mean, it's a mathematician, it, the list is really frightening, um, <laughs> and, it's, and, and, and a lovely writer, on top of it, like, insult to injury, he does what I do, right, and he's really good at that, too, um, and he's oh. written a number of books on philosophy, anyways, so he's an all-around badass, and the Stikine, which is the river you're talking about, is sort of like, the Mount Ever Mount Everest is the wrong mountain because Mount Everest is not mean enough at all. But it's just it's <laughs> so big, it's so dangerous, it's so scary, it's so insane. It's got more near death class five six rapids that could just you know kill you than almost anything imaginable. And <laughs> for Doug, it took him forever to run it, and he runs it the first time. And he pulls, he, he does it the first time, and it's heavily assisted. They've got helicopter backup. They've got all kinds of stuff. And it goes pretty well. If I, I, I may be screwing up parts of the story a little bit. It's, you've asked me to tell a story that I haven't told since I actually wrote it. So <laughs> full disclosure, I think I'm getting over all the details. right. I want to give you as many details as possible because it's a crazy story. So he comes back a second time, and they're going to do it unassisted. So no more helicopter support. They're going to carry all their own food. And it's the thing about the Stikine is it's very, very, very long, right? Like really committed rivers don't swallow you for days on end. And then once you're in there, there's no way out. Stikine is surrounded on every side by like 500-foot unscalable cliffs. And if you do make it to the top of the freaking cliff, you, there's 150 miles of Canadian wilderness where like most things can kill you and will kill you. Like you won't get past the bears oh. kind of thing. So there's literally no way out. Like once you, and, and once you start down the river, you have to finish the river. So once you go in, you so unsupported is a big deal, and it goes so horribly wrong, you have no idea. They get to the first mellow, what is for the Stikine, a mellow rapid, and it swallows Doug's partner. One, the first guy goes through, second guy gets swallowed, kicked out of his boat, oh. gets washed up after nearly drowning. He literally crawls out, and he realizes his boat is gone. So he either has to swim a near-death rapid or barefoot with no equipment 
scale a 500-foot cliff and hike out. And while Doug sat and watched, his closest friend scaled the 500-foot cliff. Oh, my and gosh. Which free soloed, right? Barefoot, no gear, nothing. And it was super traumatic and heavy and everything you possibly imagine. So what does Doug do? He decides he's going to be the first guy to solo it. Oh. Alone. Unassisted. So he comes back the third time, and for him to pull it off, so as you, kind of you mentioned when we were talking earlier, I work on flow states, right? These are states of intense focus and concentration, and we can talk about them a little bit more, where performance goes through the roof. And for Doug to be able to pull off the stacane, he was going to have to stay in a fully present, completely deep flow state, nonstop for days on end, alone, in the face of some of the greatest, you know, danger ever. Like, so much danger, he told nobody. So, no, like, if wow. something goes wrong, he's dead. Because everybody, if he was like, hey, I'm going to go solo paddle this to Keen, it's essentially like saying, hey, you know, I'm going to go out to the garage and shut the door and I'm going to start the car <laughs> and, you know, I'm going to do some deep breathing exercises. Uh, you want to watch or set up a video camera? You know what I mean? Like, that's... That's really like the statement, honest to God. And so he tells nobody. Nobody knows he's done this. So the reason I recount the story in Rise of Superman is both because, you know, Doug is clearly a deep, deep master of flow. And, you know, the whole point of Rise of Superman is let's figure out what these top athletes have done to harness flow so successfully and let's build a bridge between the extreme and the mainstream and figure out how we can use all this stuff for ourselves. And you know, with Doug, there is a number of stuff, but there are a couple really kind of clear takeaway lessons from Doug, which I'm happy to kind of break down for you if you'd like. Yeah, I, I think what led me to you is that I, I saw, gosh, there's a potential, because I took my fam I took my son to go whitewater rafting in Pennsylvania at the Yakagani. It was only a foot above the uh, the mean level, so it wasn't even near the, the, the super, super dangerous level, but it was such a an exhilarating experience and they had the guides go up ahead and and it's like why is that guide on top of that rock and he says well there's an iron pole up there to fish you out if you get stuck under the rock and so when i was reading your story i thought god this is super and you you have these vivid details yeah. of, uh, and, and i'm and like I, how do you do this like how do you do this in, in mainstream and not just ha have to be out in the wilderness to get that experience it's also one thing is also worth pointing out because kayaking is not a sport people are familiar with right and the one thing that is worth pointing out is that, of course, action sport athletes consistently, like, who's the biggest badass and which sport is more badass? You know what I mean? Like, that, those are questions that get discussed fairly frequently on chairlifts for certain. And so usually fairly high at the top of the list are downhill mountain bikers. There's no engine. There's no armor. Or the armor's not super great, and you're moving at motocross speeds down a mountain. Very tight trails. And the people that downhill mountain bikers go, oh, my God, they're totally crazy, are the kayakers. The only really? people I think the kayakers do it to are the wingsuit flyers, which I think is, <laughs> the, like, they win, right? Base jumpers, wingsuit flyers, they win. And then, then honest to God, like, the heavy-duty kayakers, because if you're measuring in terms of, like, chances to die if you make an error, that which is, you know, the rating scale, I think probably motocross probably comes in between kayaking and, and mountain biking because those guys just break colossal amounts of bones. It's amazing. They don't seem to die, but boy, they break like 50 things at once. So let's let's go into some of the, we've given uh, people the story that got me super excited to, to reach out to you. And then, and I, I know you brought, yeah, and you brought it down to a really practical level, which in and of itself, these stories are fantastic. But what's really interesting is that your mission has been about how do you make this accessible for people and what is going on chemically and maybe so I don't want to go too far ahead maybe you can just kind of backtrack and just show it just tell us a little bit about what's going on chemically and then how you're making this actionable for people yeah let me break down a little bit of the neuroscience of the why first let, let, let's start simply okay okay for those of the, for those who aren't familiar with flow states they are technically defined as optimal states of consciousness where we feel our best and perform our best more specifically, they refer to those moments of rapt attention, total absorption. We get so sucked in by the task at hand that everything else seems to disappear. So action awareness will start to merge. Your sense of self will vanish. 
time passes strangely. Sometimes it'll slow down. You'll get a freeze frame effect from your anybody who's been in a car crash. Sometimes it speeds up. Five hours will pass by in five minutes. And throughout all aspects of performance, both mental and physical, go through the roof. And the numbers, for example, just to put it in a business context, when I say they go through the roof, McKinsey, the business consultancy, did a 10-year study of top executives in flow. On average, top executives reported being five times more productive in flow. That's 500% more productive in flow. So technically, they could come to work on Monday, take, spend Monday in a flow state, take Tuesday through Friday off, and get as much done as everybody else in the company. <laughs> so if you, and put it in more ruthless, capitalistic context, two days a week in flow, and you're 1,000% more productive than the competition. Mm. It's a big number. And more interestingly, I think, and I'm going to go back in, McKinsey found, also found out that most of us spend about 5% of our work life in flow, usually without knowing it. And the reason is flow is a spectrum experience. It sort of exists on a scale from micro flow to macro flow. There are seven kind of core components that describe what it feels like to be in flow. These range from complete concentration on the task at hand to the stuff we talked about a second ago, self-vanishing, time passing strangely, et cetera, right? Microflow is when a couple of those conditions show up. Macroflow is when you get them all at once. Okay. Microflow is what happens at work all the time. In fact, one of the most common instances of flow is conversations between middle managers. When you start into a conversation that matters, discussing something heavy, so there's probably consequences, right? There's, it's a work thing, so there's little risk involved, that sort of thing. It's not a flighty discussion, but you get into a serious discussion, and an hour goes by, and you don't even notice that's a micro flow state, right? Okay. Low down on the scale, but very, very, very productive. You'll notice that oftentimes those conversations are where we accomplish what we couldn't accomplish in a two-day meeting, right? You've had two days of meetings, they don't work, but you fall into a conversation with one person at the meeting for 25 minutes, get sucked in, yeah, don't even yeah. notice you're there, and suddenly all the problems are solved. That's a micro flow state. Okay. Macro flow, which is when all these conditions show up at once, was almost feels like a mystical experience and was literally described by psychologists as a spiritual experience for the first 70 years. They had nobody had any idea this showed up in non-religious spiritual people until Abraham Maslow discovered that all successful people in the world seemed to harness this particular altered state of consciousness. And all the successful people he had studied were atheists, which is the first time somebody went, hey, wait a minute, maybe this isn't spiritual. Maybe this has something to do just with the people in general. Okay. So neurobiologically, now that we've kind of given you some of the benefits, a couple things happen that are important. The first is that our old assumptions about ultimate human performance, aka flow, was what's now known as the 10% brain myth. It's this idea that we only use a small portion of our brain at any one time, so ultimate performance must be the full brain on overdrive, right? That was the long-standing idea about what happened in these states. Yeah. And it yeah. turned, right, and you, every, there's made movies. That movie that came out a couple of years ago, Lucy, is yeah, based yeah, around yeah. this, right? Okay. It's a total myth. It's wrong. It doesn't, it, the brain doesn't work that way. And it was literally like William James said something at the turn of the century that Dale Carnegie repeated badly, and then every self-help guru after Carnegie parodied it. And that's what happened. But it's not true at all. In fact, what we see in flow is the exact opposite. Your brain isn't becoming hyperactive, it's deactivating. Huge swatches of it are becoming hypoactive. Hypo is H-Y-P-O, it's the opposite of hyper, means to slow down, to deactivate, right? And most of the areas of the brain where this is taking place are in the prefrontal cortex, part of your brain that's right behind your forehead, right? Long-term planning, complex reasoning, sense of morality, sense of will, that's all prefrontal cortex, your executive functions. In flow, this large portions of the prefrontal cortex are shutting down. This is happening because it's an efficiency exchange. The brain has a fixed energy budget. Cognition is extremely expensive, and the brain is always looking for ways to conserve energy. In flow, all of our focus is driven into the right here, right now. So focus requires a tremendous amount of energy. So the brain performs an energy exchange. It starts shutting down non-critical to spotlight attention systems. Now, these Shutdowns confer all kinds of performance benefits and explain a lot of like what happens in flow, what our experience is. So why does time pass so strangely in flow? For example, time is calculated all over the prefrontal cortex 
and as parts of it start to wink out, we can't perform the calculation. Oh, okay. Right, so we can't. We can no longer separate past from present from future, and we're plunged into that eternal now, or what researchers call the deep now, that eternal moment. What happens to our sense of self? Why does self vanish? Same thing. Self is calculated all over the prefrontal cortex. Lose the ability to perform this calculation when the prefrontal cortex shuts down. Self disappears, and we experience this as relief, as as liberation. Right, we're kind of getting out of our own way. One of the reasons is. And this, a lot of this takes place in the dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex, which is a ton of stuff, but it's where your inner critic lives. Oh. So your inner critic, right, you're that nagging, always-on, defeatist voice in your head, your inner Woody Allen. So that's, in a, flow, that's, that's a huge piece, though, shutting off that critic, right? Because that's probably something that, that gets a, it kills that kryptonite for people. Think about what happens. Like, so three things immediately happen when you shut down the inner critic. One, confidence goes through the roof because you no longer treat beating yourself up for everything you're thinking or saying, right? Confidence rises. Risk-taking goes up. Most importantly, creativity goes through the roof, because we're no longer super critically judging all of our ideas. One idea is flowing into the next, flowing into the next, and we're in the moment. And you know that flow of ideas, by the way, is one, is one of the reasons flow has its name. That's what it describes. So those are uh, some of the flow uh, triggers. Is it is that uh, kind of a well, deep deep embodiment? So, is that yeah. So let me round out the neuroscience of flow just a little bit. I won't go into detail. We can talk about it if you want. Um, but I, just let me paint the picture. Sure. A lot of mistakes that people tend to make when they want to talk about the brain is that they want to say, "Hey, neural anatomy," which is what I just talked about, right? This takes place there, so this is how we explain it. And that's just the brain's a system of networks, and if you we can't really describe things at the network level yet. We can sort of say, we think, when self vanishes, the default mode network actually shuts down. But we're not 100% certain. There may be. What we can talk about is neural anatomy, neural chemistry, and neural electricity, right? So where in the brain something is taking place and the two different ways the brain sends signals back and forth. So I'm not going to bother breaking down the neural chemistry of the neural Stay talk about flow triggers. I just want you, you, you listeners, to know that there's a ton more going on in flow. And when people ask me to define flow, other than describing an optimal state of consciousness, I think it's critical to define it by its neurological function. Now, do we understand everything about its neurological function? No, but at least it gets us past kind of the new age language that has surrounded this stuff for a while and gets us down to the level of mechanism. So just to make sure people understand the, the mechanism. So what we're trying to say is when you get when you feel a runner's high, like as a runner, you clearly come back at times and you feel this high. But there's something going on under the hood. What is going on under the hood? Runner's high, which is a low grade flow state. So the first thing that is happening is you are getting what is called exercise induced transient hypofrontality, meaning big chunks of the prefrontal cortex are shutting down. Simultaneously, you are getting in runner's high, we're not 100% certain what the exact cocktail is, but it looks like in flow, you get a cocktail of five different neurochemicals, norepinephrine, dopamine, anandamide, endorphins, and serotonin. Runner's high appears to be definitely endorphins, definitely anandamide, possibly dopamine and norepinephrine as well. We're not 100% certain about the serotonin yet, but it looks like it. So runner's high is a version of flow. What's, when you're talking about what's going on under the hood, Talking about these changes in neurochemistry, these changes in neural anatomy, you're also talking about shifts in neuroelectricity. The reason the neurobiology is important is your question. How the heck do I get more of this stuff? Okay, I get it. This is ultimate human performance. I, you know, could be 500% more productive, more creative, take more risk. You know, all this stuff is great. Like, how do I get more of it? Right? What's the practical side of it? The neurobiology is important because this is an altered state of consciousness, right? It's sure. selfless, it's timeless, it's effortless, and it's information rich. Those are the kind of its four characteristics of the experience. And you want to understand what's going on because when it like shows up, it's a wild altered state and you want to know how to maximize it, know how to bring it on, know how to maximize it when it's there, and know how to recover quickly and get, get it back when it's gone. And understanding the neurobiology, at least at some level, so this is, you know, there's mechanism. Because you go back 100 years, you wanted a state like this, well, you better pray to the muses, right? If this was considered a mystical experience, most people don't 
kind of realize that they can tune their consciousness for performance benefits. That's what we're talking about here. Yeah, That's why I think the neuroscience is important. Yeah, I, I find the neuroscience really huge. And so we've had these mystics from the Greeks to the, to the Eastern Tibetan monks and yogis, et cetera. And so it's super interesting to find out what is, what is happening because you've also explained how this can be very addictive states. And people can be just as addictive to meditation as they could to a, um, any other flow state. And so like norepinephrine, you mentioned that certain very addictive chemicals that they so, get yeah, fired. So all five of those chemicals that I just you're totally correct. The five chemicals I just mentioned, they do a lot of performance enhancing things in the brain and in the body, right? They amp everything up from, you know, strength and muscle reaction time to pattern recognition, information processing, all kinds of great, crazy stuff. They're also pleasure chemicals. In fact, they're the five most potent pleasure chemicals the drug the brain can produce. And flow is one of the only times you get all five at once, which is why flow is considered one of, if not the most addictive state on earth. And Chick sent me high pointed out that flow, unlike a lot of other addictions which tend to lead backwards, flow is an addiction that requires you to gain more skills and kind of gives you a view of what might be possible for yourself in your life. So it's an addiction that leads forwards, but it is still an addiction. And some of you know what we do at the Flow Genome Project, that we don't describe it this way, is really addiction management. Because if you are going to play with flow, we always say this is not for everybody. And, and, we, and we mean it. And, and what we mean by that is, and we'll talk about more about this when we talk about flow triggers, but flow is fundamentally addictive neurochemistry, really potent motivational drivers, evolutionary drivers. And you're playing with them, right? It's an experiential, experimental approach. Um, and you're absolutely going to get it wrong along the way. It's going to go wrong. And you're going to have to have kind of the emotional control the emotional understanding, the emotional awareness, the grit, the fortitude, and all that stuff to navigate through this stuff successfully. What happens when people don't is the artist community, which is amazingly creative, wonderful, and the highest suicide rate in the world, and why? A lot of it is because the flow is absolutely fundamental to artistic creativity, and the highs are high, the lows are low, and you've got to know what you're doing. Yeah, and I, I think the leaders that are listening to so our audience is going to be made up of IT leaders, business leaders that are really trying to navigate exponential technology change and their business being disrupted and 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 really uh, trying to bring innovation into their organization. So I have often thought that while these technologies are boosting and accelerating, that we need to figure out a way to not necessarily to keep pace, but to be able to expand ourselves to well, almost we haven't gone through a software upgrade in our own brains. And yet, Peter likes to say, yeah, in 50,000 years. So let me speak directly to IT, and let me speak directly to innovation, and let me speak – we'll get into flow triggers in a second. We'll get practical in half a second. But the reason I think flow is so important right now to entrepreneurs pursuing innovation, to people you know, in, in the corporate world, is that if you are going to compete in an exponential world, you have to be able to do two things. And we highlighted these things, and Peter and I, in bold, right? You need to be able to perform at speed, right? You need to be able to keep pace with the rate of change in the world, and you need to be able to think at scale. And thinking at scale is probably actually the harder one because the brain evolved in a linear environment, right? So we do not naturally think. We live in a global and exponential world with local and linear brains. Literally, the environment, the brain, evolved the process was moved very, 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 very slowly, and change took place over millions of years. We don't live in that world anymore, and we have the wrong tool for the job. So flow is important because it helps you perform at speed. That's what McKinsey realized, right? Sure, sure. That those addictive neurochemicals are the source code of intrinsic motivation. Drive goes through the roof, right? People who have high-flow jobs show up early, stay late, work weekends, everything's 20% time, they love their job, they're your highest producers and greatest ambassadors and happiest employees, right? And if you know, you're know you lucky enough to be one of those people, you have the greatest job in the world and you love what you do. So massive boost in motivation, that's the, that's the how, how do you perform at speed, right? And that's key. How do you think at scale? Lots of different ways to address this. One is... You've got to be able to take in more information, process it more quickly, and process it more completely. You're going to have to have accelerated creativity and accelerated learning. 
those are the things you're going to you know need to do and flow sort of provides all of them and i you know the neurochemicals that show up in the state massively amplify creativity and we can go into why if you'd like but let's just say studies kind of done all over the world, including some that we've done at the Flow Genome Project, so numbers of creativity spiking 400% in the zone. Uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's fear. And I think, you know, we have this biological brain, and maybe you can talk to us a little bit, that sort of was a physical threat, physically threatened up until 150, 250 years ago quite frequently. And now most of our threats in the Western world seem to be less physically threatening and more digitally or concept threatening. And yet we still have this brain that has to deal with kind of expanding and thinking in a different way, yet we're still dealing with threat models that are that are impacting our, our thinking capability. Yeah, that's a great point. You're totally right. I think the way Peter and I talked about it in abundance is, or not the way Peter and I talked about it in abundance, it's one of the few researchers that we, we talked to pointed this out, which is that our brain evolved to process immediate threats, tiger in the bush, right? we live in a probabilistic world. The brain doesn't understand probabilistic threats, right? Like the economy might nosedive. I might have to find a new job in two years or my wife wants to have a baby and I don't have, right? Those are probabilistic threats. They're, they don't, like, the brain cannot, our fear response doesn't turn off until the threats go away completely, right? That's how it's built. That's what you do with an immediate threat. You get crazy, have fight or flight responses for a few seconds, but that's very energy inefficient. So when the threat disappears, you calm down. Probabilistic threats don't disappear, and we never calm down. So we're living in this incredibly heightened state. It's worse because the adaptive unconscious captures, you know, mostly negative information. Sure. Or negatively biased because you need to, that's how you have to survive. The data, you know, it varies, but people say we take in nine negative bits of information for every one positive. We take in six bits for every one positive. It, nobody knows exactly what it is. And also, by the way, once you've taken those negative bits, and this is Mark Hyman's work at Berkeley, you need to take in like six positive things to retune your brain away from the negative thing. Uh, and the reason all this matters is there are different estimates to how much information we take in per second, but the biggest estimate out there is 2,000 bits a second, and they shrink down to like, you know, 140. They get really small. We're taking in tiny bits of information. The world at large, our senses gather, depending on whose numbers you want, the most conservative numbers are 11 million bits of information a second. The high-end numbers are 400 billion bits of information a second. You're conscious of 2,000 bits. So if you're only getting 2,000 bits of information, it's a vast reduction of what's actually going on in the world, and you're negatively biased to only see the stuff that scares you. Yeah. And innovation demands you notice everything else and you think it's scale and outside that fear box, right? You have to you have to actively tune your brain to do this. You can't sit by passively and let, you know, just sort of life happen to you and your brain run the show if you want to be innovative because the fundamental architecture of the brain is going to work against you. It's why in bold we talk, everybody we interview talks about rational optimism as one of their strategies for thinking at scale. What we're talking about right now is the neurobiology yeah. underneath optimism, right? Why does optimism matter? Like one of the practices we use, one more flow in your life, one of the best things you can do is start keeping a gratitude diary. And there are a lot of reasons why in Optimal Psych they think a gratitude diary, gratitude lists are one of the three most potent things you can do to massively improve your mood. They find that they do a very simple version by saying in the morning you write down three things you're grateful for and then paragraph about one of them. And do that every morning for 30 days and see what happens perspective and to the information you're taking in, and to your ideas, and how many new ideas you're generating, and your mood, and just take a look. You're going to switch one of the big filters of the brain. You're going to start taking in more information. Yeah. You know what is so good? Because a lot of the audience are going to be strong left-brainers and desperately want to develop more of this right-brain piece. So it's, it's interesting. We've started out the conversation with a lot of the reasons why and some of the chemistry around it. The gratitude journal, I'm assuming, fires up a ton of the, the chemicals that are going to need to be patented into the brain to be optimistic, correct? Less important. So your brain on fear, okay? Okay. What happens as the brain starts to get afraid is that the networks it is 
hunting for information, right? So information is coming into your brain, and your brain is saying, well, what the hell does this mean? And it's searching a particular pattern, a uh, search space for the answer, right? The more afraid you are, the smaller that search space. Does that make sense? Oh, absolutely. And what this looks like neurobiologically is tight clusters of neurons. Well, it used the most extreme example is OCD, where they can't get out of the fear loop, right? And what that literally looks like is a chain of like, uh, you know, your brain going in circles, literally, very tight clusters. So what you want access to is all your data banks, all your memory. You don't want, like, unless you're in a crisis situation where there are only three options, fight, flee, or freeze, you don't want those limits. You want every memory you've ever had, everything you've ever learned, if you're trying to solve a puzzle or a problem, right? Be creative, whatever. So you need to open that up. How can you open that up? Meditation is one tool, very useful. Another one is gratitude. What happens with gratitude It is very, very, what a lot of people don't realize, and this isn't entirely true in humans, it's completely true in lower mammals, but not true exactly in humans. It's very hard to feel two conflicting emotions at once. Doesn't tend to okay. work, right? So fear and curiosity. Animals cannot feel both at once. Dogs don't feel both at once. They will switch back and forth. And if you've got, you know, I run an animal sanctuary with my wife, and we have large packs of dogs, and you get to see this all the time, right? Where they're literally switching back and forth. We can be a little <laughs> bit gray, but it's sort of an either or. So gratitude, and this is Brene Brown's work, sure. gratitude is on the other side of shame and guilt and sometimes and often fear, right? And what happens is when you are writing down things to do, I like to do 10 things a day when I do my gratitude practice, you are remembering the things in your life that are not scary, that are going right. And by doing this, you're opening the brain up more possibilities. So you're making the brain, optimism matters because you're taking in more and different information. If you're just focused on the negative, you're taking the same information in all the time, all the time, all the time. And why this is so critical, you, you can see why this is critical for creativity and innovation. Let's talk about flow for half a second. We've been dancing on flow triggers. Let me just stop and explain you know, this from one more perspective. Okay. Flow states have triggers. We know about 20 of them, there are probably more, but the first thing to know is the most obvious. Flow only shows up when all of our attention is focused in the right here, right now. So all these triggers drive attention one way or another into the right here, right now. They're intention, they're attention hacks. They're essentially the 20 things evolutionary biology shaped your brain to pay the most attention to, okay? One of them is what I call creativity, but it's really pattern recognition, the ability to link ideas together. When we link ideas together, like you fill in an answer to a crossword puzzle, you get an answer right, we get the neurochemical dopamine. It's a reward chemical. It shows up whenever we get an answer, like fill in a notice pattern, detect a pattern. Okay. We also get a little bit of norepinephrine. Dopamine and norepinephrine don't just show up as rewards for pattern correct recognition, they tune signal to noise ratios in the brain. You said get technical, which is a fancy way of saying they amplify pattern recognition. So once you get a little dopamine and norepinephrine flowing through the brain, one good idea tends to lead to the next, tends to lead to the next, and creative ideas spiral. And we've, right? all, been in, we've all been in situations where that's happened. When it just They start building on each other, these ideas. And they feel better and better and more excitement and whatever. One of the other things that norepinephrine and dopamine do is they drive focus and attention. So not only are these ideas showing up, we're paying more attention to them, right? If you can get that loop running while the brain's pattern recognition system is searching a super wide database of potential solutions to the problem, you're under the best possible conditions for massive breakthrough insight, which is why flow states lead to major breakthroughs yeah. in science and technology. That's why it matters. And everything else, right? So if you want to perform at speed, you are going to need big insights. There's no other way around it, right? Like if you're going to keep pace in an exponential world where you're competing against genius innovators coming from everywhere because we're global and we're networked and we're linked, you got to stay ahead of the curve. Right? And as Peter says, today, if you're not disrupting your business, someone is doing it for you, right? And the only way, one of the only ways to stay ahead of the curve, to perform at speed, to think at scale, is frequent access to flow. And one of the ways to do this 
is this creative trigger. One of the ways to use the creative trigger is you need lots of new information coming in so your brain can start making connections. Really simple hack here, by the way. I tell people uh, in the Flow Genome Project, when in, in Flow Fundamentals, I think this is actually probably in the course that you're taking right now, read 25 to 50 pages a day in a book outside your main discipline. Yeah, I haven't got to that part of the course, but uh, but that is so, I don't know what is going on in the brain with that, but being able to link up, I have found, like I'll read poetry to my kids at night, and it's really interesting seeing all of a sudden during the day, I'm like, why does that line of that poem link up totally unrelated to some concept I'm studying technically? It's just really interesting. Well, but it's not. I mean, so, so that, and let me give credit where credit is due. Josh Waitskin wrote The Art of Learning, who is really, I think, one of the smartest guys working in high performance today. Love him. Great guy. Amazing. Talks about, I mean, he's got an entire educational organization, theartoflearning.org, that literally does this in schools from that level where they try to, because one of the secrets to creative thinking, right, and to drive and flow is learning how to make connections across domains. So literally, they'll, you know, you can do this in education by teaching the same ideas, closely related ideas in history, English, math, right? You surround you surround an idea and it shows up from all these different domains and you're creating the conditions for pattern recognition, what happens is kids start making those connections and here's the bonus, here's the thing that you need to know that's most important. Quick shorthand for how learning and memory works in the brain. More neural chemicals that show up during an experience, better chance it has of moving from short-term holding into long-term storage, right? So flow, massive dump of neural chemicals, massively accelerates learning. Studies done by the U.S. military shows that learning spikes 420% in flow. Wow. So to put that differently, Malcolm Gladwell's 10,000 hours to mastery, the research consistently shows that flow can cut that in half. Wow. So on top of everything else, you're not only being really creative while you're in flow, right, but you're also remembering what you're doing. It's burning it in. You're coding in new habits in high speed. So this is becoming, you know, a part of your skill set along the way, too. It's not just like this miracle altered state that shows up occasionally. You can bring it on. You can precipitate it. And it really does level up your skill set. So, so that's like the second hack that's interesting. So you can read across domains. One of them was a, uh, med meditation. A There's two reasons meditation matters. Meditation matters because it helps you downregulate your nervous system. So you're less reactive. You're less emotional. You're less fearful. That matters with flow because risk-taking is a flow trigger, obviously, right? Yeah, flow follows yeah. focus, consequences catch our attention. And, you know, you need for, to walk this flow path, right? You need to be vulnerable. Brene Brown likes to say that everyday creatives have to head into the dark, which I love. I think that's an amazing insight. Yep. But you have that level of risk-taking is like it's, it's fundamental to success in the modern world. And it's fundamental to driving flow. You know, if I'm doing this organizationally, I say, look, that you know, companies that are really good at this have the Silicon Valley fail faster, fail forward motto. And everybody thinks that it's about rapid experimentation, which it is, which is phenomenal. It's great, right? That allows you to take a lot of risks with ideas. But this is also that, that you need to create space for failure so people can take risks naturally. So that motto is an organizational way of creating space for failure because otherwise, you know, organizations are built for safety and security. They're staid, they're conservative, they're, they don't allow people to take those kinds of risks. And I also think if you're serious about hacking flow in your life, you, I mean, by the way, you don't need physical risks, emotional risks, social risks, spiritual risks, intellectual risks, take your pick, creative risks, but you have to practice on a daily basis taking risks. and. You've got to do it inside your sweet spot, right? If you're super shy and you're almost afraid of other people, then your job this week is to ask somebody for the time. Oh, okay. And next week, it's to ask two people for the time, right? And if you're a big wave surfer, this week it's 40-foot waves. Then next week, it's 40.1 feet waves, right? Slow, slow progress, and, and that slow progress is important also because the second flow trigger we're playing with here is probably the most important, what's called the challenge skills balance. So we pay the most attention to the task at hand when the challenge of the task slightly exceeds our skill set, right? You want to stretch but not snap. Emotionally, 
it means that flow sits near the midpoint between boredom and anxiety. Boredom, not enough information here, not paying enough attention. Anxiety, whoa, way too much information, I'm paying too much attention. In between is the sweet spot, the flow channel. And that sweet spot is outside our comfort zone. It's just slightly, but you're going to push past your comfort zone, so you're going to have to be better at risk-taking. You need to practice risk-taking to hit this kind of golden rule of flow. And you're going to have to be gritty because you're going to have to do it on a daily basis. So this is not about experiencing flow. It's not about uh, experiencing comfort. It's, it's just outside of the range of comfort is what you're saying. Is that right? We experience flow when our skills are pushed okay. hard, right? Hard. But you push them too hard, you get a huge fear response. Yeah. You don't push them hard enough, you're bored. You're not interested. It's super interesting because it's really a delicate balance because you brought up this really important point about being vulnerable, which means that you have to be willing to take a risk in a situation. For example, if you bring up the idea that you're an East Coast company that's not used to Silicon Valley thinking and you want to bring in innovation, and that is, puts you in a vulnerable spot, it, it spikes fear, and yet you're just outside of your comfort zone. So that's, that's a good space for you to potentially trigger flow. Okay. Yes and no. Yes, you're totally correct emotionally. No, I mean, like, one of the things I think about with companies, like, the, the scariest thing in the world is what happens after a CEO says, I got it. I got the solution. Let's innovate. <laughs> right? Like, that, like, those are really scary words from a CEO for a lot of reasons. <laughs> um, and one of the things that I believe is, I think everybody wants to innovate. I think that's the point. At, but I, like, if you really want to teach high performance and innovation, you've got to build a solid foundation. And a solid foundation means you've got to understand the fundamentals of individual high performance and then organizational high performance later on. But it's sort of like if you want to affect change on a football team, no coach is going to let you near the football team. They'll let you train up the other coaches. Right. They're really scared about what information is getting down to their players, right? <laughs> right. They really, they're terrified, right? And for good reason, right? It's really, football is hard, it's intellectual, it's rigorous, it's challenging, and everybody has to do a very specific job right. And there's a lot of wisdom on how to do that job right. So they're suspicious of outsiders for very good reason. And, but the way to work with football teams is to work with the coaches. So I think, like, one of the things I like when, when I think about how can a company innovate, I think you start... A, by taking the C-suite of the company, training them up in fundamentals of high performance, individual high performance, fundamentals of flow, so they can, you know, build on top of that foundation, and then you can start talking about innovation. Or there's the other option, if we're going to like go down this tangent, but maybe your listeners care about this, the other option that I think is, is critical, and this is not just my work, it's, it's Peter's and Salim Ismail's and John Hagel at Deloitte Consultancy, and, and we all agree that if you want, corporations have corporate immune systems. They're not, they're built for safety and stability, right? And over long periods of time. That's how they're sort of set up. Unfortunately, corporations don't have long periods of time, right? Recent research says 40% of the uh, Fortune 500 companies, today's Fortune 500 companies, are going to be gone in 10 years or less. That's radical, right? That's very short time for success. But as a general rule, corporations, they're built to move slowly so people can have jobs and so nobody screws up, right? Right. And that's why when the boss says, innovate, everybody freaks. Because how the hell do you innovate? in an organization that was designed from the bottom up for safety and security. Mm. So you build skunk works is the answer. You move innovation to the edge of the corporation. You clear the bureaucracy out of the way. You have the, the skunk works report directly to the CEO, definitely not to the CMO or in the CFO, right? right? And you build skunk works in a very particular way. Skunk works are really interesting because they're one of the most highest flow environments in the world because there are about 20 flow triggers. And if you follow Kelly Johnson's rules, his original rules from the very first Lockheed Mountain Skunk Works for building a Skunk Works, you're essentially building a Skunk Works around seven flow triggers. So you're creating an innovation accelerator, flow amplifier, and you're moving it outside the corporation. And this is like what when 
Peter goes in and talks to companies, big companies about like disrupting yourself or somebody else is going to do it for you, he says, set up edge organizations, skunk works, move them outside the company, right? Steve yep. Jobs moved the Macintosh outside of Apple when he wanted to do this. And, you know, literally do what Jobs did, challenge the company. Say, no, Lisa and Apple too, I know it's making all our money, but it freaking sucks. We're going to build a Macintosh that puts you out of business, right? Challenge your own company. Do it at the edge, though, and do it in a high-flow environment. I think those are the two choices for innovation. I could be wrong. I am not an organizational innovation expert. I have just been looking at kind of the world's most innovative companies for 20 years and trying to figure out what's going on. I see either CEOs really changing their behavior or people doing it at the edge. And there's also, by the way, you know, if you really want to scale up and go big and innovate, you've got to read Salim Ismail's exponential yeah. organizations. And, you know, if you're not doing those 10 things, or at least for, you're crazy at this point. Well, you know, competition I, is. And, as I, and as our readers are listening, your book, Bold, it talks about you know, the Skunk Works concepts you just mentioned. And, and I'm, I've never heard you talk about the individual, but I love that your focus is on the individual because you really can't affect that change unless you have those individual players really uh, deeply understanding the flow triggers and, and how they get themselves into high performance states. Well, let me ask you a question. And this, like, I'm going to say something awful out loud that I've never said in public before, but I'm going to say it. <laughs> please please really, go ahead. Yeah. With some really amazing exceptions, Google, Facebook, and a bunch of companies like that, as a general rule, when you have an employee in an organization and you don't know what to do with them, you put them in human resources. You like them, they're not great, you can't fire them for whatever reason, often they end up in human resources and hiring, and that, which is just an incredibly dangerous and crazy thing to do in the first place. But what I've discovered is that when I go in and train up an organization, I train up the C-suite and flow, it's fantastic, right? They're totally down and it trickles through the rest of the organization. When I have to work with kind of human resources and come in through that level of gatekeeper, well, and then I'm threatening to everything. Oh. And I have to jump through a million hoops and everybody has not invented here syndrome. And, you know, you want to be really, really, really innovative. And you want to bring in all this cutting edge stuff. But yeah, I got the cutting edge. It wasn't invented here. So I don't know if we can really sell our bosses on, right? Like maybe somebody wants to play that game and I don't have time. I don't care. <laughs> I always, I always say, I mean, to be uh, like honest thing about Stephen that I don't ever say on a podcast. But here's the truth: the people I mostly care about are the leading ten percent or the trailing thirty percent. I want to know who's on the cutting edge, who's on the front end, and I want to work with them. And they're usually the people on the back end are the people who tried so hard and got their ass kicked so bad that they just can't figure out how to get up off the mat. And I like working with them. Sure. Everybody else in the middle, like if you're interested in being average, cool, great, awesome. Society well, like absolutely needs this to run, but like not what I'm doing. Well, but I think the tip of the spear is that you're going for the critical few, which then influence the mass. And because even if you impact them 100% at the top of the head of the spear, you're going to, even if you have a trickle effect, when it finally gets down to the bottom of 5%, that's still a force multiplier in an organization of 1,000 or five or 10,000 employees. Well, you know, let's let's talk about your new book because there's what I was really interested in, as I know you're you're a partner in crime with the book uh, Jamie, and I only heard a little about the book, and I know you probably can't talk about it a whole ton, but you have found that there's more people interested in these concepts than probably you were aware of at first, and I'm interested in just kind of what's the thesis, what's the narrative around the new the book, and what can we expect to see from it, and what can you share with us? Thank you. So the book is called Stealing Fire. How Silicon Valley Navy SEALs and Maverick Scientists are revolutionizing how we live and work. Harper Collins is publishing it. It comes out February 21st. You can pre-order now through Amazon, right? Thank you, please. And advertisement done. As a way of explaining it, let me just tell you what happened and where the book came from. After Rise of Superman came out, before Rise of Superman came out, Jamie and I at the Flow Genome Project, we were working with elite high performers primarily military, athletes, occasionally some artists. But that was where we were, right? Really elite high performers. Suddenly, book comes out, and a broader conversation starts taking place, and we find ourselves on Wall Street, in Silicon Valley, in businesses in middle America, all over the place, right? And for me, personally, 
it is a little peculiar because what I'm doing is I'm lecturing <laughs> businesses on harnessing an altered state of consciousness, given it's a state that we have 150 years of research into, but it's an altered state of consciousness, and I am like, Fortune 500 companies want to hear about this. <laughs> How does this altered state of consciousness make me better? And like, it's a little weird, right? I mean, there's, there's no way, like, there's no way around it. Like, I can't quite believe what's going on, but that's not the strange part. Afterwards, everywhere we went, whether it was the U.S. military, whether it was Fortune 100 companies, whether it was top companies in Silicon Valley, afterwards, people were rushing up to us going, dude, yeah, that was great. That was awesome. This flow stuff, it's rad. I feel it all the time. I'm going to incorporate your, your ninjutsu. But man, I got to tell you, we just did a two-week silent Vipassana meditation retreat. We came back. We were out of our minds, and we were so productive. And after the whole team is microdosing. We're still in Saiban on a regular basis to solve creative problems, and we're going skydiving, too, to trigger flow and amplify, like, on and on and on. And, like, we're trying to promote, like, one altered state of consciousness really quietly and sneak it in the back door. And everywhere we go, everybody's sampling from, like, the full ecstatic toolkit. And what we started to realize is it wasn't one or two people. It wasn't one or two. It was everywhere we went for five years, essentially. And we started to realize a number of things. We started to work some numbers, and we started to realize that if you look neurobiologically and kind of define altered states that way and you kind of measure our economy, you realize that people spend trillions of dollars a year trying to alter their consciousness, most in terribly sloppy ways. But this is going on to one-sixteenth of the global economy already. What is happening right now is people are getting much more precise with which altered states they're interested in. We're getting much more precise in our neurobiology, but what we're really seeing is a secret revolution in altered states of consciousness at highest levels of business and society and culture. And these states are leading to radically different ways of doing business and radically accelerating innovation along the way. So it's really about a revolution that is already sort of here for emerging forces that are kind of picking up and driving this forward and really what it means for society. What's wonderful about it and what's dangerous about it? Because as you pointed out with flow, right, like upside, downside, got to know both sides of the coin. So that's what Stealing Fire is about in the quick and dirty nutshell. So first of all, I think that uh, Stealing Fire and in sort of this group of books that, that, that we've talked about I really believe that people need to understand. So we are dealing a very with a certain pace that we're probably not engineered for a pace of existence right now. And I think this type of material and information allows us to have the possibility, the hope that we can up level, upgrade software upgrade at least in our brain of what's possible. The link at the at the business level is massive. The link at the human individual human level is massive. And maybe as we wrap up, what do you think the top two or three or maybe five potential things that people can do. I know we've mentioned a couple that they can actually go research and uh, themselves, but possibly, like you mentioned, meditation. We mentioned a little bit about athletics, like running, and we mentioned uh, mindfulness. But what are some other things that pe people could potentially start so to look into? Let, let's start at the most basic level possible. Flow requires focus, uninterrupted concentration. Research consistently shows three or four times a week 90 to 100 minute blocks of uninterrupted concentration. Organizationally, this is a radical restructuring because you need to be able to hang a sign on your door that says, piss off, I'm flowing, for 120 minutes at a time. And during that period of time, you're off email, you're off instant messages, your phone is turned off, you are not looking at social media. I, you know, I like to do this first thing in the morning. I get up at 4 a.m. and I write. 4 a.m. till 8 a.m. or if I'm in research mode, I research. Or if I'm working, you know, on something for FGP, my hardest task I do it first. I do it before my workday actually starts, and that's what I do. If you, that's not possible because of your schedule, your home life, you can do it at the end of the day, or you have to import it into your office. But if you're not doing that, you're losing. Like it's just you can't even get into the race. So you need a sacred block of time where you can just deeply get into con to a concentrated focus state so you can tap that yes. high-performance state. Yeah. Okay. And by the way, the meditation, I believe box breathing. 
which is what the Navy SEALs use. It's a very specific kind of meditation. I'm not going to break it down here. You can Google it. There's tons of information. In fact, somebody in our community built a box breathing app for it that's available through iTunes. But it downrides your nervous system, so you are calmer. You'll take more risks. You'll stay, it's easier to stay in that challenge skills sweet spot. It will train up focus so that when you go into your uninterrupted concentration periods, you are better at staying focused. By the way, if you're meditating, if you're doing box breathing 10 minutes a day, that's great. That's a win. That's huge. Start out with four minutes and go up one minute a day. Go to, and then stop at 10 minutes. Don't like... This doesn't have, I mean, if you want to go crazy, go up 20 minutes, but like, like, I don't think you need to go beyond that. One of the things we look at in Stealing Fire is that a lot of the benefits that we used to think we could only get from long-term meditation practices show up very quickly, five weeks, eight weeks, with very short periods of meditation. You know, I want to second that. I've uh, been experimenting with the with the breathing for now for a year, and I've used it with my uh, with the Wim Hof cold ice baths. It has a significant, very powerful, very oh, very I mean, powerful. You uh, the ninja, and you're going to totally back me up on this. The ninja move is you do an apnea training, so you do box breathing for ten minutes, and then you do breath of fire if you speak yoga, or Wim Hof's breathing if you speak Wim Hof for three <laughs> minutes, and you can follow it by. You know, I follow it by breath holds because I like to train the outer threshold of grit and see how long I can hold my breath, and I go, I go full Wim Hof with it. But, like, you should be doing that every day. Also, because you get aerobic benefit from the breath of fire and the apnea breathing, box breathing, you actually, your VO2 max actually increases without aerobic exercise, which is crazy. Yeah, those are amazing, and I, I have found personally that it, it definitely pushes into a, into a flow experience and sort of I can go into my meetings. I can go into my meetings with very challenging situations, much more uh, steadied out and, uh, and calmer. Yeah, the best person to uh, – Josh Waitzkin, again, to go back to him, you go to his education organization's website. There's modules under all his high-performance calendars, and he's got one about building your trigger. And it's basically a combination of visualization, meditation, breathing, and a handful of other things that put you, prime you to be as close to flow and as not bad as possible right that you can use before your biggest meetings. And he thinks it's one of the most important things to figure out. He's got a great process for how to work backwards and do what's perfect for you. Really neat. Well, Stephen, this has been a blast having you on the show. I, I highly recommend to all listeners go pre-order the Stealing Fire book. I am uh, going to go get that myself. And also, I will have links to all of your previous material. Where do you want people to, to go to the Flow Genome Project, or what are your thoughts on uh, LinkedIn, well, Twitter? If you, if you really actually want to talk to me, you want to talk to me on Twitter, which Twitter, is got it. Stephen underscore Kotler. I'm very responsive on Twitter. I'm all over Facebook all the time. I use it a lot, but I'm in 11 different places. <laughs> flowgenomeproject.com, you got to go to, if for no other reason, we have a free flow profile. Anybody can take it. And what it does is it says, it's tradeology. It says, if you're this kind of person, you're likely to find flow in these directions. So these are the kinds of activities to seek out. It's a really great first step. And if you want more information on the flow triggers, go to my website, stephencutler.com, sign up for my email newsletter, where you'll get all kinds of you know, information about the cutting edge of technology and high performance and take your pick. But you'll also get a free PDF that outlines 17, that was where our research was at the time, I need to update it, I know, but 17 basic triggers, how to use them, where they show up in, you know, action sports, education, business, blah, blah, blah. So really actionable stuff. Well, Stephen, we're going to put all of this on our show notes, and I, I really appreciate you for all your hard work in getting this information out into the world, and uh, I hope we can have you on the show uh, here again soon. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. Okay, everybody, that wraps up this episode with Stephen Kotler, and I hope the passion for the topic came through. I hope you learned a bunch from my conversation with him, please go to the show notes page at redzonetech.net forward slash podcast. Also remember to subscribe to the newsletter so you can get access to the content that my team and I are producing outside of this podcast. So until next time, I again, I appreciate you for the most precious resource that we all have, which is time. Thank you for your ears and listening and your time. Have a great day. 
evening or day, wherever you are, and we'll see you at the next episode. Bye-bye. So there you have it. This wraps another episode of Bill Murphy's Red Zone podcast. To get all the relevant show notes, please go to our blog at www.redzonetech.net forward slash podcast. Additionally, make sure you go to iTunes and leave your comments in iTunes about the show. This helps our show rankings enormously and it helps support the show. Until next time, I appreciate you very much for listening. Thank you. Thank you.